Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you for joining today's webinar, part of the ATA Engineering Webinar Series. Today's webinar is entitled SimCenter 3D, Understanding Response Dynamics versus Dynamic Response with our presenter today, Dr. Chris Van Dam. I am your host, Scott Tebow from ATA Engineering. I'm going to give a few uh, intro slides for those who are less familiar with who ATA Engineering is, and then I'm going to turn the session over to Dr. Van Dam. For those who are not familiar with ATA Engineering, we are an employee-owned small business headquartered in San Diego, California, with a full-time staff now pushing 200 fairly hard uh, with over 130 degreed engineers on our staff. We are constantly growing and constantly looking for good quality engineers to join us here at ATA. ATA Engineering provides high value engineering services in a number of industries, uh, principally aerospace and defense, uh, but also robotics and controls, uh, a, a growing business in themed entertainment like uh, you know, roller coasters and animatronic figures and such, but also industrial and mining equipment, consumer products, and general manufacturing. Customers bring their most challenging uh, product design issues to ATA, and we apply the best tools in the industry with some of the smartest folks in the industry to come up with innovative solutions for them. We provide services throughout the US from our many offices uh, across the country. Our headquarters is in San Diego, California, but we also have offices in Los Angeles, the Bay Area, Denver, Albuquerque, Huntsville, Alabama, where I'm located, and in Herndon, Virginia, outside Washington, DC. And from these offices, we provide high level design, analysis, and test services for our customers. In fact, we are one of the largest and perhaps most well-known providers of GVTs, ground vibration tests, uh, for aircraft in the country. One of the other things that ATA is known for is for providing uh, licensing and support for Siemens engineering software. We are a Siemens platinum level value-added reseller. And as a reseller for Siemens, we provide not only licensing, but also technical support, training, uh, and integration support for a wide range of Siemens products. These include not just the ones we're looking at today, NASTRAN and SimCenter 3D, but also NX, VMAP, Star CCM Plus, Team Center, Solid Edge, and others as well. Today's presenter is Dr. Chris Van Dam. Uh, Dr. Van Dam is an expert NASTRAN user and is an instructor for Siemens official course on SimCenter 3D response dynamics. Uh, in fact, ATA Engineering provides the curriculum for all of Siemens uh, English NASTRAN training. So all of the training materials for anyone learning how to use Siemens NASTRAN are actually developed by ATA Engineering. In fact, if you look for a course in, uh, on NASTRAN uh, topics, advanced uh, NASTRAN capabilities and such, you'll discover that many of them are coincidentally held in San Diego or Denver, Colorado or Herndon, Virginia. And that's because they are being held at ATA locations and being conducted by ATA instructors. And uh, Dr. Van Dam is one of these. Uh, as an ATA project engineer, he uses these products on a daily basis to deliver the very high-end solutions that I was talking about before. And as an other, another interesting tidbit, uh, Chris and I started on the very same day uh, in 2019 here at ATA, and we met one another in the vestibule of the ATA headquarters office in San Diego on our first day of work for ATA. Take it away, Chris. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, so thanks everyone for attending today on the discussion on understanding response dynamics versus NASTRAN dynamic response. So just kind of a background, you know, 
people are joining this because they're interested in structural dynamic problems. Uh, structural dynamics arises in many different fields of engineering. Uh, this could be aerospace where you have aerodynamic loads, say on your launch vehicle or your airplane. It could be in the automotive industry where you have load roads going in through your tires and in your suspension system and into your car. It could be civil where you're designing a, a building, maybe in a seismic uh, active zone. So you need to make sure that it's safe for earthquakes. Electronics, say you're designing a new type of a phone, you can have drop tests, maybe even in the medical industry where you have some rotating components. So all these are different uh, industries and different scenarios in which you have uh, dynamic excitations of your parts. And as an engineer, you need to ensure that your part, your vehicle, your building, your device is structurally sound enough to handle those type of di dynamic environments so that, you know, it won't fail. Um, and just, you know, the, the classic introductions to some of these dynamic problems is we can take a look at the Boeing 747 flutter problem. Here we can see these large vibrations of the aircraft wings as it's encountering flutter. And then probably one of the most known structural dynamics issues of all time is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, where uh, once again, kind of a flutter issue in which you're exciting one of the modes of the system. In this case, a very drastic uh, response is shown. So we need to make sure that we uh, properly analyze all our parts so um, things like the Tacoma Narrow Bridge doesn't happen and then our automobile um, operates properly and our planes fly safely. So now getting into the actual software tools we're going to be talking about today. Um, NASTRAN Dynamic Response, which I'm going to abbreviate as DR at times, and then SimCenter 3D Response Dynamics, which I'm going to call RD at times. I'm going to kind of color coded these as well. Both have the same goal of tackling all these challenging structural dynamics problems, and they can all be applied to those various uh, industries uh, provided before, as well as those types of loading. So both of these pieces of software are able to compute the response due to various types of load. This could be transient load due to, say, that drop test. It could be a harmonic load due to some sort of uh, rotating equipment. It could be random load due to some maybe aeroacoustic loading that's on your plane, or maybe the wind going over the front of your car as well as some shock response spectrum. So both of these can do that. And just some examples of the, the inputs maybe we're looking at are shown on the right where you have a harmonic input. So, you know, just a sine wave at some frequency or maybe some random input. Additionally, both pieces of these software are able to apply loads in various forms. So these could be concentrated forces, right? If you have your car, maybe you're idolizing, you know, your force input to the suspension system as a concentrated force. You could have distributed pressure loads, right? That could be load, uh, you know, the, the pressure distribution across an airfoil on your airplane or fuselage. And then you could also do a, in a force motion. Uh, so in that scenario, it would be kind of your civil application where, you know, you're looking at the response for your building to an earthquake. You can essentially provide a base shake via that enforced motion. So both of these are able to handle the same types of input loadings as well as the same types of application of those loadings. So that's to, to start so we can have a bit of a commonality between these two. Now, NASTRAN dynamic response and response dynamics both solve those types of dynamics problems as described and are able to apply those you know, excitation types as well as application types. But they are suited towards different types of problems at times but more so different types of users. So in general, dynamics, dynamic response is a general purpose dynamic software that can handle a wide variety of problems. So at its core, NASTRAN is a solver and does not really include a generalized pre and post processing capabilities. It allows the user to select a pre or post processor of interest. So that could be FEMAP, SimSummer 3D or another one. Um, the advantage of dynamic response is that it has many solvers at its disposal to tackle these wide var uh, variety of problems that uh, you may encounter. Now, response dynamics, although it does still solve dynamics problems, is more of a specialized modal dynamic software that streamlines dynamic analysis. And I'll get into the modal aspect of this in a little bit for those who are less familiar with it. But basically, it's able to tackle efficiently kind of a subset of some of the dynamics problems that NASTRAN dynamic response is able to handle. And one of the, the reasons many people choose response dynamics is it does provide a nice unified environment for uh, pro uh, streamlining these processes. And that's all within SimCenter 3D. And so basically everything from your pre 
processing to your solving to your post processing is all in one uh, single environment, which you know helps streamline that and keep things compact. It also adds a lot of functionality for interactive plotting. It comes with built-in function editing and signal processing tools. So if those things are of interest to you, uh, response dynamics is definitely a plus. Um, but one of the things that I'll get into in a little bit is it relies on an uncoupled modal dynamics algorithm, which basically limits some of the class of problems that it can tackle. So in general, dynamic response and response dynamics have a very similar workflow, but excel at different stages of this workflow. So in orange, I'm representing kind of the, all the aspects of NASTRAN dynamic response. In blue, it'll be response dynamics. And in gray, it's kind of the, the agnostic things or things outside of this at times. So in general, for both of these, you'll start with some sort of uh, preprocessor. You'll maybe Simpson or 3D, maybe FEMAP, maybe another one. So it'll generate a mesh of your component of interest. Then you're going to send that to some sort of mode solver. So let's go through the response dynamics workflow first. So you'll have NASTRAN compute modes of your system because response dynamics is a modal solver. You'll bring that into response dynamics to solve, say, your response to due to some sort of excitation. And then still within response dynamics, you can do all your post-processing. You can uh, plot contours, save your stress. You can plot acceleration as a function of time or frequency, depending on your loading scenario, et cetera. Now, if we look at a dynamic response workflow, it's very similar, where if we want to do the modal route, we'll use NASTRAN to compute modes. And then we'll also put that into the NASTRAN dynamic response solver, where it'll compute the response due to some excitation, whether that's transient, harmonic, random. Then after that, the solver will spit out results into typically an OP2 or punch file, depending on your uh, selection. But then you'll need some sort of third-party software to post-process that. So if you want to visualize what, once again, the stresses are, you might use SimCenter 3D or FEMAP. Now, if you want to plot accelerations for you know, time or frequency, you could do that in some of these post-processors, but a lot of times people will use um, scripting languages such as MATLAB, Python, or Excel to do some of that post-processing. Um, one additional thing that NASTRAN can do, which I will talk about shortly, is you can skip the modes part of the this workflow and just compute response of the entire fine element model of interest if, if that is desirable, and I'll talk about some cases where that's uh, needed. So in general, these workflows are the same, but I'd say the uh, specific software excel in certain areas of this. Um, where NASTRAN dynamic response excels would be in the actual solver itself, because it's able to tackle a larger variety of problems. It's a little bit more versatile on that front. Now, response dynamics, where that excels is in essentially streamlining the entire blue part of this process. It keeps it within one single unified environment. It's able to quickly set up a whole bunch of different types of scenarios. Say if you needed to do a bunch of different analyses in terms of transients, harmonics, randoms, those can all be set up very quickly with response dynamics. And then once you do those solutions, all the post-processing is done in the same spot. So you don't need to worry about taking your data from one program to another program. It's already there and it's ready to be processed. So the seminar is going to focus on four areas of comparison between NASTRAN dynamic response and response dynamics. The first is going to be direct versus modal response. This gets into those coupled versus uncoupled algorithms that are in both of these software. The next will be damping representation, which is somewhat related to the coupled and uncoupled algorithms that are available. Uh, we'll talk about um, kind of damping in its general form in the modal domain, and then some also some things like frequency dependence. Function management will be the third one, which is really we're going to talk about that more on the response dynamic side, because that's really where uh, that uh, software excels. We'll talk about the generation, storage, editing, and visualization of functions within response dynamics. And then the last one is just user and problem types and where one software may excel over the other. Um, one example is, you know, response dynamics typically are using a GUI where you can click buttons. In NASTRAN, typically you're editing decks or using some sort of preprocessor to, to dump out that deck for you. So there's a couple of things we'll talk about that. So one of the, the biggest differences in terms of capabilities that I'll highlight is the direct versus modal response computations. So with this, we're going to have to do a little bit of math involved to give some background here. That's OK, because math's awesome. So uh, first, we'll start off with our fine element equations of motion. 
uh, we'll just look at a single degree of freedom oscillator shown here. Where right, we have on the left a mass with a spring as well as damper attached to the ground. Uh, so that spring has a, a stiffness K, damper a damping value C. Now, if we generate a free body diagram of that, we can uh, essentially uh, figure out what the forces are applied to this body, um, which are shown in the equation of motion on the right, right? Our mass times acceleration is the sum of all forces applied to that, good old Newton's law. Um, and if we sum up that, it equals to the external force applied to the system minus our uh, stiffness contribution of the force, which is that Kx, then also the damping contribution, so that Cx dot. So this is a single degree of freedom equation of motion. Uh, it's pretty pretty straightforward. I'm sure most people have seen this before. Now, if we go into multi-degree of freedom systems, we can once again look at simple things like a spring mass system. But in general, what we want to analyze are more complex geometries and more complex systems, which will typically generate using a fine element model. So this is where your SimCenter 3D or FEMAP will, you know, you'll mesh your CAD, it'll generate a mesh of that and it'll be able to output that mesh that you can use to represent uh, the system. Now, in this case, the equations of motion are essentially the, the same, except now because it's a multi-degree freedom system, we're dealing with matrices as well as vectors. So the mass, stiffness, and damping matrix um, are all n by n, say if you had an n degree freedom system, and then the vectors are n by one. So in this case, you have a, a coupled set of equations that you need to integrate in time to figure out the response if you're looking at, say, transient response. So one of the things we typically don't want to have to do is actually compute the response in the, the physical domain at times because you're integrating a large number of equations. Typically, meshes nowadays are in the orders of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of degrees of freedom. And so integrating those equations uh, is, is pretty computationally expensive. So what we'll do is we'll instead uh, transform things to the modal domain, uh, which we'll be able to accomplish via an eigenvalue problem of the undamped and unforced equation of motion. So if we remove the damping and external force of the system, we just have mx double dot plus kx equals zero. Um, we're going to be just setting up an eigenvalue problem here. So if we pre-multiply by the inverse of the mass matrix, we can rearrange that equation to look like the second one shown there, which results in identity matrix times our accelerations plus this A matrix times our displacement. We'll um, kind of skip some of the, the steps here, but basically if you assume a harmonic response of the system, this is the typical derivation of your modes and frequencies, you'll assume your displacement is harmonic, so it's some sine or cosine term. If you take some derivatives of that with respect to time, you can essentially do some algebraic operations and result in the x double dot term equal to uh, negative omega squared times x which you can replace with a lambda. And so lambda is the typical notation for an eigenvalue problem. So the, the final result is the equation at the bottom, which is the form of an eigenvalue problem, where if you solve this, which um, NASTRAN has solvers built in to do this, as well as most numerical computing libraries, you'll be able to identify the eigenvalues, which correspond to the natural frequencies associated with the undamped and unforced system, as well as the eigenvectors, which are the mode shapes of the undamped, unforced uh, system. So to give uh, a little visualization of kind of what those are, for those who are less familiar, um, we can visualize mode shapes to see the physical response at each one of those uh, modes frequencies. So once again, I just kind of have that eigenvalue problem shown up top where we're solving for the mode shapes, which are the kind of the physical deformations that are be shown here, and then also the frequencies. So that would be the frequencies at which these modes occur. So in mode one, uh, we kind of have this little rocking mode of those two brick elements shown there at about 74 hertz. And then if we go to mode three, we can see at about 114 hertz, we're going to play bending mode. And then mode four, about 122 hertz, you kind of get a little bit of both of those. So at each one of these frequencies, these would be the deformation shapes you would expect to see. And this is the kind of the first step in that in that uh, workflow that I showed where you're going to be taking the, the mesh, you're going to throw that into Nastran, it's going to compute modes, which are these quantities of interest, and then you'll be able to use these modes for dynamic response calculations. So we have to go a little bit further down to uh, generate our modal equations of motions. 
So the undamped force vibration can be written in the generalized coordinates or modal coordinates using the mode shapes. So once again, we'll start with our undamped, unforced equations of motion. What we can do is do a coordinate transformation to express the physical solution in terms of the normal modes of the undamped system. So that's that second equation where we're saying our physical deformation X is the sum of all the mode shapes with the product of their uh, generalized coordinate. That can be rewritten as just a simple matrix vector product where phi is your uh, matrices of your mode set and then Q is your generalized coordinates. You can then substitute that into the undamped unforced equation of motion. Uh, so you'll get essentially replacing X with phi times Q for each one of those. So that's a third equation there. And then the last part of this process is we'll pre-multiply by the mode shape matrix transposed or phi transposed. And then what, what that does for you is the phi transpose times M times phi, as well as phi transpose K times phi, result in a set of diagonal matrices. Now, the advantage of the diagonal matrices, which I'll talk about on the next slide, is that because they are diagonal, you result in a set of uncoupled equations of motion that are easy to solve. So as mentioned, the, the result of that coordinate transformation is an N uncoupled systems of equations. So we can write that as this kind of new equation called M bar and K bar used to represent our matrices in the modal domain. So for an example, we'll just take a look at a three degree of freedom system. Typically the mass matrix M bar is uh, mass normalized. So those are all unity across the diagonal. And then the stiffness matrix K bar is the uh, eigenvalues along the diagonal or the, the frequency squared. So in this case, um, you result in a series of single degree freedom systems that can all be solved uh, essentially independently. So that's what's denoted in the third equation where you have um, say M sub I, I, you know, the ith diagonal term times the acceleration plus the ith stiffness term on the diagonal times the uh, displacement is equal to phi transpose of that mode times the, the force vector. So in this case, you essentially transformed a large coupled system of equations into a set of uncoupled single degree of freedom system equations. So you can use this to simulate the response of each mode due to the excitations, and then you'll recover these modal quantities and then when you're done, you can use those mode shapes and generalized coordinates to recover your physical quantities of interest, right? If you care about displacement and accelerations, you can use those mode shape vectors to recover that based on the modal quantities. Now, why do we go through all this math? Uh, because the big distinction between capabilities at times between these two software is the ability to either integrate a coupled set of equations or uncoupled set of equations. So Nastran dynamic response and response dynamics can both compute modal dynamic response, but only Nastran dynamic response can compute uh, direct response, as well as um, using a coupled algorithm, which is required for that. So as, as mentioned earlier on, typically we don't want to integrate the direct fine element equations of motion. That's because it's typically pretty expensive. And we try to avoid that when possible, but there are certain scenarios when that may arise. Um, and so some examples when you might want to use direct response is, is really high frequency transient events. Um, so your modes computation, if you need to do modes, say, to 10,000 hertz, depending on your ex excitation, that actually may take longer than integrating uh, the equations of motion of the FEM for a short duration of that transient event. Um, something else is that when nonlinearities are present, so it, Anytime you have, say, material nonlinearity due to plasticity, geometric nonlinearity due to large deformations, or contact nonlinearity due to opening and closing of gaps, uh, you'll need to use some sort of direct transient solver and typically some sort of nonlinear solver associated with that. One of the additional aspects when you might want to use a direct response is when you have frequency dependent stiffness or damping. So, kind of the equation on the bottom left represents your frequency response equation which we haven't gotten into yet, but essentially in certain scenarios, you may have frequency dependent stiffness or damping. A lot of times it will happen with um, elastomers where at a certain frequency, they'll have a different damping and stiffness than um, at another frequency. 
So the, the big takeaway is that if you need to do some sort of direct computation of your FEM equations of motion, you'll need to be able to use Nastran dynamic response for that. And so that is able to use the coupled algorithm to integrate the fine element equations of motion, which are kind of shown in the equation on the top right there. Now, if you don't need to go that route, then both Nastran dynamic response and response dynamics can use an uncoupled algorithm to compute the response in the modal domain based on a, a set of uncoupled single degree of freedom systems. And then it, they are both able to recover any quantities of interest in the physical domain. So once again, you can recover displacements, you can get stresses because stresses are a function of displacements. And then you can also get things like your accelerations or velocities of interest. So going on to the next topic, which will be damping representation. This follows suit to the direct first modal computation because at times uh, damping may result in a set of coupled equations in the modal domain. So as stated, depending on the physical damping matrix, modal damping may not be diagonal, which requires a coupled algorithm to solve. So this is one of the, the big distinctions between capabilities in the software and, and from my perspective. So if you remember from modal dynamics slide earlier, where we we're doing the derivation, we didn't include damping in that. So let's just include it now. So now on the top right, we have our FEM equations of motion, uh, but now we have that CX dot term, which is our damping term. So once again, if we do our coordinate transformation, we replace X with V times Q, we result in that the third equation there. And then if we once again do the pre-multiply of the phi transpose times um, all the terms, we get diagonals for the mass and stiffness matrix. That's because those mode shapes are computed using the mass and stiffness values, so they're orthogonal with respect to those. But in general, that phi transpose times C times phi is not going to be diagonal. Now we can talk about a couple of cases when it's going to be, um, and that's when it's uh, proportional to the mass and stiffness matrices. So if, if C is simply some scalar times the mass plus some scalar times the stiffness, then you will result in a diagonal uh, dam modal damping matrix. That's because the mode shape still diagonalize that matrix because essentially it's a sum of the, the matrices that it is orthogonal with respect to. Now, some cases when damping is not diagonal, uh, so non-uniform damping. So say, um, you have localized damping in your model. And so in NASTRAN notation, this would be if you have param GE on some subset of elements of your system. So maybe you know that this part is a lot heavily damped with respect to the, the rest of the model. You might be using param GE, but if you do that, you are gonna result in essentially localized damping. So not uniform damping, and then you'll get a non-diagonal modal damping matrix. Uh, some other things is you can add uh, C bush elements, you can add damping values on those. Uh, you could have C damp I elements, which is another kind of localized uh, damping element. So in any case that you don't have uniform damping, you'll result in uh, a not diagonal modal damping matrix. So in general, uh, the diagonal terms are the most important. So this isn't a huge uh, issue at times that response dynamics won't account for these. But as the damping matrix becomes less proportional to the mass and stiffness matrices, the diagonal terms start to become more important. So it's kind of, you just have to know a little bit about your system at hand and what you need in terms of your dynamic software. So Nastran dynamic response and response dynamics both can transform that physical damping matrix to the modal damping as described on the, the last slide with that phi transpose times C times phi but there are some limitations with response dynamics. So Nastran dynamic response can transform the physical damping to modal damping using those mode shapes and it retains all the terms. Uh, so you'll get a fully populated damping matrix. The downside of that is that when you start to do the integration, right, you'd no longer have a set of uncoupled single degree for the systems you're solving. You have a smaller but yet still coupled uh, set of systems you need to solve. So there is some computational costs associated with that. Um, so it'll transform both viscous and hysteretic or structural damping that's in your model to the modal domain. Additionally, you can specify modal damping directly, right? So if you know at you know, mode one, you have 2% critical damping, you can specify that. 
Now, response dynamics can do the same transformation, and it does that. But when it does that transformation, it's only retaining the diagonal terms. So at the bottom, kind of just gives you a little idea of what's going on, where essentially it'll still do the phi transpose C times phi, but it's going to only take the diagonal terms of that. And that's because it only has that uncoupled algorithm. And so it does not want to know anything about those off diagonal terms because they're not being used. So once again, this will transform both the viscous and hysteretic or structural damping uh, to the mobile domain. But if any of that is non-uniformly distributed, you're going to have off diagonal terms and those aren't going to be accounted for. Um, similarly to Nastran dynamic response, you can specify modal damping directly. So, right, you have a modal test, say, you know, you identified the, the damping ratio of all your modes, you can uh, plug that into both response dynamics as well as Nastran dynamic response. So in, in general, if flexibility and damping is important for you, then I, I would recommend Nastran Dynamic Response as the tool for you. Uh, the reason being is it has many damping representations. Um, so you have structural material. You can specify that uh, variable modal damping. In the modal domain, you can have discrete viscous dampers throughout your model. You can get even fancy with starting doing things like a direct matrix input. That'd be like DMIG. Um, you can have nonlinear dampers. Uh, frequency dependent damping, which is kind of that uh, discussed a little bit earlier in the direct versus modal uh, analysis. And then you can also have very, very complex things like implementing dynamic transfer functions, as well as uh, DMAP implementations of custom damping. So if you're looking for flexibility, um, then I think Nastran dynamic response is a tool for you. But if in general you stick to a majority of the damping, which is uniform structural damping, material damping, or you know your modal damping and you just want to specify that on the modes, then response dynamics is, is still going to be uh, a good a good choice for you. So now we'll get into something more specific to response dynamics, but I think it's one of the things to highlight because that is kind of what gives it a big um, edge over a NAS dynamic response, and that's how you manage functions, or some people might want to call them curves, and how you process those. So response dynamics provides a unified environment for not only function generation and editing, but also management and visualization. So NASTRAN dynamic response in general, it has all these different table table D sub I cards that define different functions for dynamic excitations. And basically this is just a, a tabular data and text format that it's going to use to essentially query some value at some time, right? You know, if you have some uh, base excitation, acceleration signal versus time, it's just going to be, you know, amplitude versus time. And a lot of those will just be stored in, in your FEM preprocessor, or you can generate those using scripting language, but there isn't really a, any sort of interactive tool to use in order to visualize those actually within Nastran dynamic response. So there's no yeah, interactive post-processing. You can't manipulate things. You need to go to a third-party software, such as you know MATLAB, Python, or Excel to do a lot of that. Now, response dynamics is essentially the, the opposite of that, where it has everything you really need in terms of functionality, and generating, editing, storing, manipulating within its user environment. So you're able to store all these functions in what's called an AFU file or associated function file. And you can store these for you know, specific problems of interest. So you just analyzed your airplane and you have all these acceleration responses throughout. You can store those in an AFU file or say you're working on a really large spacecraft and you know you got 100 components and they all need, have these different PSD specs. You can have an AFU file with all those PSD specs and then everyone in your company is able to kind of reference those and use the same ones. So um, if, if you're good with organization, this is really a, a way to streamline a lot of your analyses. Um, and so you, the AFU file can contain many different function types. Um, so in the case of, you know, if you're designing this one part and, you know, you have a list of requirements that it needs to make, you can say, you know, part A, AFU, excitations. And so in that case, you'd be able to apply your, your PSDs, your transients, your harmonics, and whatever other environments are needed to that part to it. Once it solves, then you can have actually the responses associated with that FEM or SIM part. 
um, or you can, you can copy those and make those independent. So additionally, Response Dynamics has a variety of signal processing and function capabilities. So it kind of gives you a little bit of that flavor of things like in MATLAB and Python and Excel directly within your user environment. So say you just computer the response and you want to compute then say the FFT or the PSD or SRS of some sort of time signal, you're able to do that directly within response dynamics without having to go to some third party software. You can also envelope over functions. So say you have a bunch of different load cases and you want to figure out the maximum stress, you can envelope easily over those results, or you can, you know, add two functions, subtract two functions. So there's a lot of different tools in there, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. So we'll kind of go through a little bit of what Response Dynamics has to offer, just, um, mainly just to streamline uh, some of these analyses and showcase how it does that. So for example, uh, there's this function toolkit um, on the top left, if you're on the Response Dynamics tab, and there's a function toolkit where it has capabilities of generating various types of signals for you. So in this case, we generated a, a 25G half sign pulse. Um, it's pretty simple to do. You can uh, put in your parameters of interest, say amplitude, the time period, um, the number of intervals, and then as well as the, the, the ordinate type. So you're able to generate that really quickly. Um, it'll then create that in your uh, AFU files in the XY tabular functions uh, navigator. So you, it's a nice handy spot where you can visualize all the functions within your AFU files, as well as within your analyses that you're doing. And so you can interactively plot these, uh, manipulate these, save these, et cetera. So in this case, it was a pretty simple setup. We generated this half sign pulse, and then we're just gonna apply it to this uh, electronic box as a base excitation. So we can do that pretty easily. Um, you can set that up, you can run the analysis, and then once it's done, you can quickly post-process those results. So once the solution's finished, the function outputs are immediately available for plotting and response dynamics um, once the response is solved. So this is the, one of the, the advantages of response dynamics over Nastron dynamic response is in that case, you need to go to some other software to do your post-processing. So in this case, we can just look at what the transient response due to that half sign pulse is. And you know, we're just looking at two different uh, nodal response locations here. We can kind of see you get this a decay in response to that half sign pulse. And once again, on, on if you kind of look to the left and the, the table in the XY tabular functions, you can see that it'll just store your uh, requested responses in there. So you can query those later, you can manipulate those later. And speaking of manipulating, we'll just do some quick operations on these to show um, how you can do that within the same environment. So if we have that time history response, we can use the built-in signal processing capabilities within response dynamics to streamline our post-processing. So maybe you're interested in, you know, the uh, FFT of the response, or maybe you're interested in the SRS of the response or PSD. So in this function toolkit that I've highlighted here, you're able to do all these different uh, signal processing operations on your data. Um, you can do integration, you can do differentiation, you can generate all these different types of signals. And so it's just a really streamlined way to go from input excitation to solve to post-processing all in one environment. And so that's what really Response Dynamics excels at is just streamlining that entire um, process. So as, as an example, uh, I just did two of these really quickly for that, which in that function toolkit, did an FFT of that time history that was shown on the previous two slides, and then also uh, an SRS of the time history. And so in this scenario, we are able to plot these interactively. You can query points if you want, you can zoom. So there's a lot of great functionality in terms of uh, visualizing plots, changing, say, if you wanna know the phase and magnitude of your FRF, you're able to plot that. And then also once you do those operations, if you can see in the XY tabular functions navigator, again, there's two new functions that were made now. So we had our two time functions of those responses, but then when we applied these signal processing techniques, so the FFT, as well as the SRS, we generated new functions of those. So that's one nice thing is that as you do this, you'll generate these new functions that you can store and save for later.
So now on to the, the last aspect of this, which is user considerations. And this you know, may be the most important part, depending on your problems and you as the user, um, because a lot of this in terms of the workflow comes down to how you work and how your company works and what software is going to best fit into your uh, work style. So response dynamics, as shown a little bit earlier, enables the user to set up dynamic response computations using a, a pretty nice graphical user interface. And one of the nice things about that is it, it shields you from a lot of Nastran terminology. Um, I'll kind of just talk actually on the left here first, we'll talk about setting up, you know, a Nastran dynamic response. You need to be very familiar with Nastran cards as well as Nastran deck editing. Now, most preprocessors will generate a lot of this stuff for you, but it's generally good practice to make sure that, you know, what it's spitting out is what, um, what you put in, as well as a lot of times people such as myself will just manually make all these cards um, because you've done a type of analyses before. So you can kind of reuse some of the loading setups. Um, you can use include files to streamline things. But in general, what you need to do to set up a single transient load is all these different cards. So I just kind of threw a little snippet of something in the below to set up a transient excitation. So you need all these, you need a D load card, a T load card, a time step, a force definition, a table D1, an S stamp. So there's all these Nastran cards that you need to set up this analysis. And, and right, if you do a different analysis, you're gonna need a different set of cards, et cetera. And so if you have a large number of analyses to do, you need to be one, very familiar with Nastran, two, organized in terms of how you manage all these, and then and three, you have to make all these different decks. Now, response dynamics takes a kind of different philosophy there where in order to perform the dynamic response, it kind of shields you from a lot of that Nastran terminology. I would say everything is essentially a mouse click away and most things are uh, well-named. So you'd be able to say, click on the tools um, within the run response dynamics ribbon. You could say, I wanna do a translational nodal excitation you could then select the excitation of interest in terms of you know the function that's going to use to scale that first time reverse frequency so everything is essentially a click away and it shields you from having to deal with a lot of those uh, nastran cards uh, one of the other advantages of the response dynamics is things are very reusable so right if you have a certain uh, signal and you want to apply that to multiple different nodes uh, those excitations can just point to that function. You can also do a lot of copying of things. So if you set up one analysis and you want to do some minor tweak to it, you can just literally copy or clone that uh, response dynamics setup and then run another analysis on that. So as I stated a little bit earlier, the, the software that's best suited for you really is going to depend not only the type of problem you have to solve, which we discussed a little bit earlier, but also what type of user you are. So in general, Nastran dynamic response allows more flexibility over the entire workflow. You can choose your preprocessor, you know, whether that's FEMAP or Simpson or 3D, or if you're just making, you know, editing decks manually, like sometimes that I do, or you can choose your post processor as well. So if you want to visualize your results and something else, you can choose that. You can choose how you want to process your data. You know, you have your MATLAB, Python, Excel. And so I think a lot of this process tailors towards those who want a little bit more flexibility in that workflow. Um, also those who like to script to automate a lot of these processes. So some things with that deck editing may seem kind of repetitive, but if you have things set up with Python or MATLAB, a lot of that can be automated. Now, response dynamics, I'd say is well suited for those that want everything in a single environment. So there's one interface for that entire workflow. Um, and that's all contained within SimCenter 3D. So you don't have to leave that at all. If you have your cat in there, you're able to build your model, you're able to solve the modes, which it just kind of goes to Nastra and then comes back. You don't have to leave it all. Your excitation setup's all done in response dynamics. Um, your solve's done in response dynamics and then the post-processing's done in response dynamics. So. Um, those are kind of the, the big trade-offs I see in my mind is, you know, flexibility um, where you, you can kind of uh, plug and play with the different software you want to use on the, the front end and back end versus response dynamics where it's all in there in one, one piece of software and you can kind of streamline that as needed. The one uh, additional thing which I wanted to talk about, which gets into more 
uh, advanced capabilities that Nastran Dynamic Response has that aren't available in Response Dynamics. Um, this kind of comes down to the more of the type of problems you have to solve than, than the type of, of user or workflow your company uses. So one of the big things is for both the modal solvers, um, they're linear solvers, so you can't capture nonlinearity, but Nastran Dynamic Response is, if you're using direct response computations, able to uh, capture displacement or velocity-based nonlinearities using these no-lin cards. So these are just single degree freedom nonlinearities, kind of force displacement type things, or force velocity type things, where it's just a table lookup saying, you know, at this single degree of freedom, if I have this displacement value, this is my force, and Nastran essentially applies that as an external force to the system. One of the other things that is is very powerful, but also, you know, with great power comes great responsibility is a direct matrix abstraction program or DMAP, which is a tool that enables Nastran users to alter the Nastran solution sequences. So this is a very advanced use case and, and unless you're familiar or really have a need to use this, um, I would I would stay away from it because the, the saying is the best DMAP is no DMAP. So unless you really need to alter something, then it's best to leave the default Nastran solution as is. But there are some scenarios when, you know, maybe you want to query some information at a certain point throughout a solve, or maybe you want to, you know, tweak some aspect of a, of a stiffness matrix, you're able to do that with DMAP. Um, and then some more general capabilities that Nastran has that response doesn't is, is kind of getting in outside the, the general structural dynamics realm where you start to include some other type of physics. So we start getting into a couple of fluid structure analysis, um, things like aerodynamic flutter, uh, dynamic aeroelastic response, where you start to have some fluid elements in the system, or similarly, acoustic elements and acoustic loading. Um, so those are some scenarios where, you know, if you have this broader range of problems, um, response dynamics not going to be able to handle that, uh, but Nastran dynamic response can. So I'm going to wrap this up with just a little Venn diagram of what I think the highlights are in terms of similarities between the two pieces of software and then differences. So let's we'll just start with uh, the similarities. So both can perform uncoupled modal response analysis uh, using diagonal damping matrix. They both can do transient harmonic random and response spectrum analysis. They both can apply concentrated forces and forced motion and distributed loads to the system. Uh, this wasn't really discussed, but it is important to note is that both can address modal sufficiency that can arise when you have static components to your load. Response dynamics uh, solves this using something called mode acceleration data recovery. Dynamic response, uh, Nastran dynamic response uses mode acceleration, or it also has the option of what's called residual vectors. So now, things that are kind of unique to these two is that Nastran dynamic response can do the direct response computations. It's able to do transient harmonic random and response spectrum. It's also able to, in the modal domain, do a coupled modal response where you have the full damping matrix that results in that coupled set of degrees of freedom of those systems. There's also additional damping capabilities we discussed. There's the custom solution alterations using DMAP, um, some nonlinear capabilities, and then that general kind of plug and play in terms of how you want to deal with the pre and the post-processing. Now, response dynamics, where it thrives and excels is that unified environment for everything, for the pre-processing, the solving, and the post-processing. It's got all those built-in function tool generations, so you can generate you know, that half sign pulse or a square pulse or PSDs or harmonic response. You can then use also those signal processing once you're done with the solve. You can compute the FFT, the PSDs, the SRS of your, of your responses, or you know, say you want to integrate or differentiate something, you're able to do that. And then if you need to generate reports, you know, one of the, the nice things about this as well is you can use interactive plotting and editing and saving to essentially generate all those nice pretty plots that you'll include in your report. And this is all done within that single integrated environment within some Center 3D. And then with that, um, that's all I have. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Terrific, thank you so much, Chris. So we will now take questions, uh, if anybody has any for Chris. Um, one question I have for you, Chris, I'll kind of like, uh, you know, uh, seed the well, if you will, prime the well, is, uh, I know that you can use any kind of preprocessor to create the original model for the purposes of 
um, you know, creating your modes, uh, you know, calculating your modes and all of that. But to what extent uh, will FEMAP do any of this stuff with NASTRAN dynamic response? Can it do uh, much of the setup or are you uh, pretty much, uh, you have to resolve yourself to like making the cards like you were describing? So most preprocessors, FEMAP included, will still be able to do a majority of that card generation. You know, you're able to apply the concentrated loads or, or pressure uh, across the surface or in force motion. And it'll still generate all those cards for you. So I'd say in general, the deck editing is more of a, an efficiency thing in my mind where um, you can kind of recycle those definitions. Um, but yeah, FEMAP and, you know, even things like Abacus, et cetera, they'll all be able to generate those cards for you. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, we did have a question about the uh, similarity of the GUI and interactive tools in SimCenter 3D to those in uh, Star CCM Plus, but I did answer it in the text chat. Essentially, there there's going to be some you know commonality between different Siemens products, and that's fully intentional. But the actual interface in SimCenter 3D is much more similar to that of NX uh, than it is to Star, because SimCenter 3D Engineering Desktop is effectively uh, NX at the at the top end. I Does anybody guess. else have a question for Chris here? Yeah, Scott, I'll, I'll read in a couple additional questions that came in. Um, okay. Chris, you mentioned that the preprocessors, whether it's FEMAP or SimCenter 3D, um, can help set up the NASTRAN cards for NASTRAN dynamic response. Are there ways to visualize you know, the curves that those cards represent, or can you, you know, how does post-processing, like, can you take those results and, and use some of those tools like back in SimCenter 3D to look at dynamic response results? So in dynamic response itself, on, on the front end, so if you're putting like a table D sub I card that defines some sort of tabular data, um, most preprocessors have a way to visualize that. So I know FEMAP does. Um, I'm sure SimCenter 3D does. On the back end, so once again, that's actually you know not NASTRAN dynamic response. The only visualization aspect of dynamic response is there is an XY plot option you can do to output. And that's really just going to generate a bunch of plots um, that are not interactive, we'll say, but it, it will generate plots of the responses requested. Um, the, the control over those plots is pretty limited in terms of, you know, how do you, you know, set your X spacing, your, your, your Y limits, your access titles, et cetera. Um, but you could, you know, within once again, FEMAP, you know, if you did your, your solve using NASTRAN dynamic response, you bring those results back into FEMAP and you are able to visualize those. Um, but NASTRAN dynamic response itself, I'd say doesn't really have any capabilities. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Um, and maybe I think the last question I have until I turn it back to you, Scott. Um, Chris, like I, I know the focus of this was SimCenter 3D and SimCenter NASTRAN, but just in the context of other Siemens tools thinking about FEMAP, are there any like GUI based FEMAP tools? Um, I, I'm th thinking about Fibrata specifically. Can you just comment on, you know, very high level how that compares to dynamic response and response dynamics? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, Vibrata specifically is very similar in terms of the workflow of dynamic response. It's kind of more the FEMAP version of that. Uh, some of the advantages of Vibrata is you are able to use the full uh, damping matrix. So it does have a couple algorithm in there if you need to, you know, utilize that. Um, but it, I'd say the, the, th the theory behind it is very, I mean, that's not the, the philosophy behind it is, is very similar to response dynamics where it's basically this modal solver that's very good and streamlined at performing that type of analyses. And it's able to do all the, the same things, you know, the harmonic, the transient, the, the SRS, et cetera. Um, so they both have a very streamlined approach to modal dynamics. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and, and not, not to derail this webinar, we have entire other webinars on Vibrata if you're looking for a GUI based approach in FEMAP. Um, but yeah, Chris, I appreciate your presentation. Scott, I think I'll turn it back over to you to wrap up. Very good. Thank you so much, Jonathan. So if you have any questions or uh, do not already have licenses for the software that was mentioned today, 
uh, whether it's NASTRAN or SimCenter 3D, BMAP or Vibrata, uh, you can reach out to me at, with my contact information here on the screen and I'll be happy to help you. Um, if you do already license the products and want some assistance with them, uh, keep in mind you are entitled to ATA, uh, ATA's uh, well-regarded hotline support for all of the products that we support for you. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on dynamic response versus response dynamics. And please come back and join us again for future webinars in this series from ATA Engineering. Thank you very much for joining us.